Our 13th ESL1 is underway here in Katowice, the mecca of European esports. Welcome back. Thanks for your patience as well. We know it's a, a little frustrating when you've tuned in to watch a match and you can't watch it when it was expected to be on, but we want to make sure that the players have got everything they need and they're in the right space as far as their technical stuff is concerned. So we'll fix any issues that they have. Hopefully that's all done and dusted and we're five minutes out from our draft of our third series of the day. We've got uh, a couple of uh, old pros here on the panel. A couple of old stalwarts of the scene in the form of Persian folk. How are you doing? Oh. I just thought you were talking about yourself again. I, I, thought I, you. I was. They were all adjectives I could use for me when the old stalwart. The, the best thing to do is like when, when you cut to the wide shot, it's just you um, and you're like, oh, it's just me. Oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm just here on my own. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about these two teams then. Um, I know that we've kind of previewed them, their strengths and their weaknesses and what have you. Um, Nip Alliance, it's an interesting matchup for me, Fog, because... These are legendary teams, you know, outside of Dota as well. Yeah. And they have a long history between, obviously, alliances that are completely Dota orientated, but they have got some fight game players and they have been in other games over the years, like StarCraft and what have you. It's always been Swedish. And NIP, likewise, has always been Swedish. And it's still got Get Right there, still got Forest there playing in the CSGO Major. And congrats to them to get to the uh, the new legend stage as well. It's changed a little bit, though, when it comes to Dota. They've, they've got this kind of, you know, mixed international team with an American leader now. It's it's a different a different approach for them. So they have they have no, they have no Swedes. No, they have no Swedes. Oh my! Yeah, which is very unusual. But a, okay. but a departure I, is it a sign though? Is it? Wait. I'm kind of what I'm driving Wait. at. I guess is is alliances way the you know the Swedish Scandinavian route is it outdated now? Have we moved on significantly now? And where really only China has an all Chinese team, and even then now they've started experimenting outside of that box and pulling other players in. I never really thought that that kind of thing mattered. It's just like, okay. do you speak? Do you all speak the same language? Right. Yes, good to go. Okay. Right. So whether it's all English or all Swedish Ace. or all Chinese doesn't matter. Exactly. Ace is Danish, which is Scandinavian. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's close Scandinavian. Enough. Scandinavian, That's close not enough. Swedish That's though. Close enough. Same thing. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Careful. Kevin, it's, it's I'm like going to stop group, you getting lynched It's a group right of now. like four countries that identifies like the okay, same. Okay, but Scandina no, Scandinavian and Sweden is different. Yeah, I know. One's yeah. a country, one's like a yeah, group of countries. Yeah, but don't tell Swedes right? they're Scandinavian. Stop. No, they don't like being... No. No? No. All right, I don't know what I'm... If, whatever. By the way, I just going to point out, those Alliance hoodies, <laughs> it's on the camera right now. I actually got an Alliance hoodie, and they're super comfortable. They're really? Right. That's all it takes? Just, just one $30 sweater for you to shill on broadcast? I, I, think, wow. I did like it. it was, it's green, and it's comfortable. I gotta, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to produce okay. a Purge Gamers hoodie. Just one. It's going to be super comfy, and I'm going to give it to you. I, I, will, know, I know you're going to shout it out. Yeah, and absolutely. then you just right. sell loads, right? A good sweater? No, just just, just, I just, just one? one. Just going to make one? For Try, frogged? Trying to push my uh, my YouTube series, that's all. Right. That's my okay. marketing goal. I like it. Yeah. I like Purge Gamers. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> it was just a, a general observation that they've changed, you know, and was that was that a, a, a different... Because I always feel like Dota has been the leader when it comes to international lineups. You look at Counter-Strike over the years, it's always been very much, you know, five Brazilians, five Brits, five Germans, five Swedes. That, in the last two years, they have started to see multi-game teams now. Penta, obviously, FaZe has been the most successful one of those where they've had a multi-national um, team. Dota has always been that kind of, you know, scene, except for Alliance. Yeah, I think that's, for me, that's kind of the beauty of esports. Since we're still, like, we're still in the beginning, right? We're still yeah. forefront of esports. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where we have, you know, we have our options open. You know, yeah. we look at the actual sports and stuff, and there's a lot of just you're playing with your country. Here, mm -hmm. we have the option to do whatever because we're not locked into your country. Right. You're playing online. Yeah. So I think and that's playing, actually really cool. And we're kind of global too, aren't we? We're not yeah, absolutely. restricted in any way. I know it's more regional oriented, like SEA and what have you, but it, anyone can play with anyone. If you couldn't, as you said, I think your key point was was the point that I'd missed at the start is if you can speak the language the same language together isn't that it? wasn't my point I was, was thinking about okay. Denmark the whole time <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, I, I the only experience I have of this is that I played with Swedish guys and we went to get a Dane to come into our team mm -hmm. and he said no please don't put him in our team all I hear is like someone speaking Swedish with a potato in their mouth mm. whenever I listen to or watch videos of people speaking Danish it just sounds like English gibberish like it sounds wow. like English, but I can't understand what they're saying. Really? Hmm. Sometimes. I'm so offended. Maybe it was just one video that I watched. I don't know. Why, why are you offended? English gibberish. There's no such thing. Uh, no, I mean it literally to my brain. It, my brain is like it's English, and then my brain's oh. like start begin translating, and oh. I'm like, mm, I oh, okay. cannot compute. That's right. that's what it's like. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, in terms of their lineups, then fogged. Where, where, where is the strength in these two lineups? Is it is it with NIP? Have they got the established stars, or or are we seeing these? You know, the boxy, for instance. Are we seeing these players come through? Uh, overall, for like just player strengths, um, 
I'm not too sure. I think overall, like these, for me, these two teams are more just about like the actual team dynamic. I, c I can say some you know the, some of the players that are a little bit weaker than the other ones, but as for anybody just like completely over over standing out over the rest of them, I don't want to like just be like you know 33 right. for you know for MIT. But he would be the obvious one, wouldn't he? For Alliance. Yeah, of course. But I'd say overall these teams are still they're still like learning learning each other and all mm. that. So I, I don't know. I'm not too sure about that one. Mm. And and as far as uh, Ice is concerned, this is um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we we looked at him last season, Kevin, and it, and he looked good at times. On secret, and we thought, okay, th they've unearthed a gem here. He's been around for ages. It's not like he was a new player. He'd, he'd been playing a lot, but he'd been playing a lot in tier two, tier three kind of teams. Suddenly, Puppy plucks him out of the, that era, puts him in secret, and he looks like he's meant to be. Um, has anything changed? Um, I think he's more consistent now. I think he's fantastic on their lineup. They definitely yeah. give him a lot of space and like prioritize making sure that he gets farm, whereas Fada plays more like tanky early game tempo heroes, kind of what Fada excels at, like Razor, yeah. um, Viper, those kinds of play styles. Um, I, I think he's done great on, on their lineup though, so I, I expect him to have a good performance. And he's not really even the only person on the team that has been playing well. Like almost everybody on NIP has excellent games every single game, mm -hmm. at least at the... Uh, at we played, that was the case. So yeah. even if one of them underperforms a little bit, someone else is going to pull up some slack. And at the end of the day, it'll come down a little bit to like execution and maybe draft matchup kind of right. stuff. Maybe how some team fights go. I, I mean, does the inconsistency come from that drafting? I mean, normally we talk about Peter and uh, PPD in the sense that he is a great drafter. He's a very thoughtful drafter. He thinks about what's good for his team, what's bad for the other team, what's what works for his team. He tries to get his, his players to play the heroes that he knows can win or work together. He's very thoughtful about it, mm -hmm. but sometimes is a bit stubborn, isn't he? Absolutely. And you know what? The more I'm actually thinking about it is the more I am kind of relating these two teams together because they run, they run, uh, they run drafts sometimes that are a little bit weird out of the meta, right. right? And also, I also look at their mid players and I feel like their mid players can sometimes be the ones that can be the ones that are lacking a little bit. Right. And then I look at their off laners and the off laners are sometimes the ones that are balling out of control, the 33 and the boxy. So I'm like, yeah, actually these two teams remind me a lot of each other. I would say that um, Nip has more consistent peaks, though. Definitely. Generally, I mean, maybe not recently, but um, their individual skill just feels higher. Because I feel like it, I have trouble sometimes trying to think of who's the best player on Nip. I always maybe jump between like Soxa sometimes and three three. Always make like the most incredible plays, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, whereas I don't feel that as the same consistency on Alliance. Like they have some really good games for sure, but they have some mm -hmm. some really low ones sometimes. So I guess yeah. I, I see what you mean. They're they're similar, but current power level it's not the same that okay. oh that's for sure yeah i still have nip rated a good amount higher. i just mean like the way that they style i guess in a way yeah they're similar for sure yeah i guess their highs are higher as it were yeah. yep. uh let's uh, also check in with an ip while we've got the chance to do so and uh find out from them exactly what's going on in the world of ninjas in pajamas we did kind of hit a rough patch disappointing result in the minor and then we started the we pretty much kind of kicked it off we, try, we started practicing a lot more and playing a lot more pubs and a lot more scrims. And I think uh, the results like, kind of showed that. So we, we will just try to keep doing that. There's been a new patch uh, recently, like yesterday. So we're just going to play a lot of games and try to figure out what's the, the good stuff now. I wouldn't say we are really working on anything special. We just kind of play the patch, try to figure out the strong heroes and just play them. Pretty much that's about it. This patch is actually very good for us. It just kind of feels like we get to play more of the heroes that are better for us, especially me, Farah and Ace. We get to play a lot of heroes that we like more than we did in the previous patches. In Dota, especially right now when the game keeps changing and everyone kind of started playing more and more and more and more, then you can't really make excuses. You just have to play all the time. Like If you want to keep up, you have to play pubs all of the time. Otherwise, you just kind of fall behind on the meta. So like the personal play style, like, sure, it's, it's kind of nice. But most of the time, you kind of have to just follow, follow the game, and maybe like bring your own, your own stuff into it. But you can't just play your own thing and just I, I like this hero, so I'm just going to play this. You have to kind of follow the patches. I usually don't really try to think about my expectations too much. I think if we get to play our game, then yeah, we can beat any team. Yeah, plenty of uh, thoughtful words from Netta there, uh, aka okay, 33 on NIP. He says you have to follow the patch and then you have to work hard and you have to play a lot. And I like how he mentioned, you know, like that it, when these patches keep happening so much, you know, meta changes and old heroes that were really good come back into play. Yep. So 
you know, Fada, some of Fada's classics, the Razors and stuff like that, start coming back. Some of 33's classics, the Bat Rider and all that, starts yep. taking back Fada too. I like that a lot. Yeah. Mm. Um, if there's one thing that's going to hurt him, I mean, I know he said that he's kind of okay with the, the meta and the, the patches and everything else, is the CK, because he's playing, been playing a lot of that uh, yeah. in the last month or so. So the changes, do you think that's, you know, is this one of those teams that just go, screw it, we're going to play anyway because it's not that bad for us? Yeah, I think 3-3 uh, uh, is so versatile and so skilled that he can play a lot of different yeah. heroes. And I think in some ways it's a negative because in a lot of the Valentine Mendes matches, he, he'd play like offlane Ursus and uh, other weird heroes. And he would be able, if they got the right matchups, he could abuse his lanes and like easily win the game. Yeah. But other times, I think when your draft is that flexible, there was other games where like they would open something out of the box to be like, oh, now we're going to outplay you in the draft. And then it would end up being like, okay, now we have to do some weird like shift thing rather than just being like we're gonna open CK it could go safe lane or off lane we could swap the players yeah. but it's pretty straightforward how it's gonna go you know yeah. whereas if you try to do some other thing some other tricky thing thinking that you're gonna be able to outdraft your opponents if they do throw a wrench in your plans it can leave you with this hero that might feel wrong for the game and that's a case where having that flexibility can hurt you all right well the uh, the bat is taken out uh, yeah. Sax has been playing an awful lot of that bat rider as well so it's a, a good ban for alliance i guess the life stealer as well we've already seen how effective that can be on that eight second big kb uh, 16 second cooldown uh, basically stealing life in between yeah, and, uh, and the lich two, yep and two, i think those three bands are i mean first three bands are really yeah. solid and I then think and the same on the other side right the, yep. the druid get rid of it chen we already know i mean is that going to be the most First phase band hero of this tournament. Chen? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you're That's playing, isn't it? I think for sure, and especially if it's Alliance. Alliance, yeah. they play, they open with like Lundra Chen or Coddle plus one, like majority yeah. of their games. They play Chen a lot. And yeah, there's the CK. Like, yeah. Interesting. On the Nip side. He's just, he's just is so that good. Because Alliance have the first pick? It, I, it, I think almost every team is going to consider banning the hero. It's just so much better than a hero like Sven, for example, in an offlane position. Sven's a great support, yeah. um, but. Also been nerfed, though. Just, but it, again, it's only like level one, I know. Yeah, it level gets two. That's it. And still think it's perfectly viable though. It's it's yep. you you get regen from your strength, you're getting regen from your life steal, and then you just buy a couple items. And then when a fight starts, you pop your ulti, you reality rift, and you probably kill one guy, a support, maybe a core, how depending on how farmed you are. So it's just like it's so easy to like do something in a fight, even if you get caught first. Whereas other heroes like Sven are just easily controlled. I like this. We got a sex opener. Call. Wait, no matter what, no matter what Alliance picks here, I like this opener from NIP more already. Okay. I think it's, I think Coddle is a hero that's still incredibly powerful. I think the Brewmaster and the Coddle have good synergy. Yep. And I think Brewmaster is also one of those heroes that we're going to see banned in the first three phases a lot at this tournament. It's not an awful lot of uh, flex in the draft though. There is the, it's pretty obvious who's going to play what. We've actually saw, or we already saw a five Brewmaster today. Mm -hmm. Actually, we saw SVG playing the five Brew. I think we could see. I mean, that's an offlane hero too. So You'll see I think him. they've got a little bit of. A little, a little bit of, yeah. I mean, 33's played it the most of yeah. uh, any of the NIP players. He played so. it last time that I saw them pick yep. the hero, and uh, I felt the only the big negative to it for the other games they were played is that it didn't give the same crazy lane presence as something like an Ursa did, because he had one game where he just was super out of control, basically, dominated the lane, his opponent had to leave. Brewmaster can only do that when his ulti's up, and he usually also takes an extra hero to rotate in, so it felt like it didn't quite match his lane potential to the player. Uh, but it is going to give them better team fight. The laning stage itself is going to be safer. It's a good pick. Yeah, I love it just because the first two heroes right here they secure massive team fight. Yeah. You can dis you have a way to dispel now for the Sven shield. That can it's always you know the annoyance of the Sven a lot now. And then you have Willow Wisp and Brule. So if you've got those up in a fight, I don't already like Alliance is going to have some yeah. Alliance going to have trouble taking fights into NIP. You could argue the second skill is a missed chance too because it's a yeah. chance to hit yourself. So That's if you true. end up casting it before before you split off, it could be good. And um, the Maiden. Yeah, CM is what buffed basically within like two small patches. All of a sudden, she gets 20 armor from her ultimate. Um, her skills are still kind of weak, but the the wind lace change was significant, arguably as well. That was the third thing, probably that's affected her. Very slow hero, but now if you buy wind lace, you're gonna buff up her base movement speed. She'll be more competitive against other fast heroes. So that'll help a little bit. But you know, mana for your allies, it'll help you win the laning stage. You've got team fight. You've got roaming. Secrets been picking it. It's it's gonna be a hero. It's gonna finally. be. Yeah. Similar, it's like it's always going to be a hero that one little small change kind of comes and everybody's just happy because it's like, oh, we have a CM on our team. Yes, like mm -hmm. I can now skip my X mana yes. item. Indeed. I don't need my bottle. I don't need my arcane boots. Yeah, I don't need my skip whatever. Up, say, some sage's mask upgrade that'll cost yeah. you a thousand gold or something. Exactly yeah. helps. Spin up both the troll and the timber. 
Uh, timber was used a little bit by Nip in one match where they just, it was like a beautiful Timber game fodder, just like super owned and mm. tanked everything. It was uh, pretty straightforward. So a little bit of history. Very good as well in that hero. He is. And it's the one thing we kind of felt like was his playstyle was a little bit straightforward. Like if he plays a tanky mid kind of hero, it really fits him. But if he has to get out of his comfort zone, like he played a Monkey King one game and it just wasn't very good. It was yeah, like he didn't quite... It's not like the yeah. same. He doesn't play like snowball. Of, I wouldn't kind say of they're out of the meta, but they're not popular meta picks with other teams. The Razor, for instance, is his most picked in the yeah. last month. Yes, it's been back in the meta, but it's not. It's not ultra popular out there. It's not everyone playing it. Yeah. it it's specific mids who are playing it. Um, he's also picking the bristle mid as well. I was about well, to say the is, bristle. He's the other one. So yeah. you know, he's not a traditional mid right now. The he's, bristle, he's out there on a limb a little bit. The bristle was against Gambit though, and that was uh, part of, partly as a solution to beat their. Sure, their but it's his like second most played this month. Okay. It, it's not just a one-off pick. He's, he has been consistently okay. it, playing it. So it is also it is a combo too, right? Yeah. It can be a combo, especially yeah. with the coddle, with like even. The Lich. But then he does have, I mean, he's played Viper this month, he's played DK this month, he's played the OD, which is a bit more meta, Tide's a little bit more meta as well, Pugna and Huskar. So he's, he, that's a really wide range of, of hit types of heroes in there. That sounds like a lot of fodder heroes. It does. Ooh, speaking of the bristle. There's the bristle. It's on the Alliance side though. So, so they have Ciamora for it. Yeah. They've got this uh, shield. They block, have so. not played this bristle as a core, by the way. What? They haven't been playing it as a core. Are you saying they played Bristol support? Because um, that doesn't sound right. Sounding to me. that either. I'm just saying I haven't seen it as a core in the last month. That's all. What do you mean? Uh, I haven't if seen it. Sorry, I haven't seen it at all. Oh, uh, okay. Last month. Sorry, I was like, that implies that they've no, no, been playing no. it not <laughs> as a farming hero. And <laughs> I just don't think that would no, work. No, Boxy well. played it one time. I see. Here. Yeah. yeah. Boxy went the Radiant Oxygen kind okay. of build versus a, a CK. Oh, that was know. one game at the Madness tournament. I don't even like that build that much. And the Ursa on the other side, uh, obviously I'm, for an IP. I, I hope they match up versus each other. I love seeing Ursa versus Bristol because yeah. they just they're both sitting at like 10% HP trying to kill each other yeah. the whole time. What's, what's interesting about this Ursa pick though is that is a 33 hero, yep. as is the Brew, yeah. which now does give Alliance a little bit of a headache as to okay which are they playing. It could easily be Sox, so maybe. Right. Yeah. I like this Ursa too now because it gives them it gives them Rush, so now they've got this. Super team fight with the Coddle plus Brewmaster to control around the pit, and then this Earth can just right go in there, get the ages for them easily. I'm pretty sure every game Nip played that we play, they were always radiant, so they always prioritize. This is this is Peter's weapons. thing, isn't it? The radiant. It's. Okay. I mean, it was definitely one team we noticed with every single game. They were always on radiant. I'm they pretty sure that was one dire game. as well. Yeah, one dire game in the final, yeah. and they lost it. But they played all radiant the rest. Of the, yeah. Literally pretty, radiant. Did, didn't every they do game that at the minor game. as well? Interesting. I'm pretty sure they did that at the minor. I think so. You think yeah. you're right. I would have yeah. been Progress so confused well. if they were on the dire team, basically. If they were yeah. on yeah. the right side of the screen, yeah. I'd have been like, what? What? Yeah. What's happening? More so if, that would have been very so if you want to beat them, the coolest thing to do would be like, what's a really sick Radiant strat we can steal from them? Or yeah. maybe like, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of nice knowing that what they're going to play around in some Slaughter? Ways, right? Look at that. We got, so we've got Slaughter for NIP, which yeah. is going to be good to be able what to that storm? go through the Bristle. And now we've, we've got uh, a Storm. Do you know, I, I was going to mention the Storm, because that CM, that second pick, it, it, was, it, it triggers me every time. You know why? The Level reduction. 15 the mana talent. reduction talent. 14 percent reduction in mana spent. Storm. Yeah. He's back. He's, He's back. back. <laughs> this is what we talked about earlier. So Slardar stun. I mean, they've got the Bash and the stun. They're gonna have a Bash, but their disables can be a bit limited. The thing is, Willow. Willow is annoying too, because the thing about Storm is, if you get disabled once, the follow-up is usually there for you to mm. just get brought down. And by Willow, you mean Willow Wisp. Willow Wisp. Not yes. Dark Willow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No Dark Willow here. Weaver banned out. Interesting. I guess their limit on disable it could well play Ursa easily, kill Coddle many times. Yeah, that mm -hmm. Weaver's for the storm as well, right? Uh, what do you mean? Not really. No, they don't really, really pair that no. well, unless you're like no. buying eggs or something. I think it's because of the mobility thing. Yeah. yeah, they just don't have the best disables just yet. Um, so Nip might want to consider more disable. That's definitely the big thing. I'm just curious as to who's playing what right now for Nip. I thought yeah. that was money that he was holding, not a hand warmer. No, no, no. <laughs> like he cash. just uses cash to warm his hands. Yeah, it just makes sense. Like, oh, <laughs> damn your sweat. They've got so much money, these Dota players, yeah. that they just use old old $10 notes to warm their hands. There's a lot more I'm sure he uses it for. Wiping his uh, butt, etc. But the, the really rich players use $100 notes. Exactly. Because they're warmer. Exactly. They're warmer. <laughs> makes you feel <laughs> better. Oh. My necrophos. The Benjamin warm hand warmers. Uh, 
Necro is Necro for Alliance. good against Slardar, mm -hmm. good against, good against Ursa. Ursa. Not so great against Bristol, hypothetically, because he can uh, dispel it. Through, yeah. But in the same vein, it's going to make it really easy. Like, when I think about people on ninjas getting Reaper Scythe, it looks kind of scary because they've got all these tanky people. Mm -hmm. If you just get them a little low and then you throw that out, you've got a guaranteed disable. And especially pairing it with, like, Storm. Like, I could definitely see some late-game scenarios where it's, like, blink on Necro and Storm's on the map, and then instantly they get pick-offs. This is uh, a very unalliance alliance lineup. They've got it's like weird. They've got very limited team fight. I mean, That's we talked about the fact yeah. that they were stuck in their ways a little bit and they weren't playing the meta, but th this is out there. That's a cool disable. And a DP. Sounds good versus Bristle as well. Gives them another, another catch for the Storm Spirit. Yeah. Mm. Pressures. Lane Silence too. is so good this game. Good against Bristle, good against Storm, good against Necro. It's 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 an interesting. This is a weird game. Very different than what we saw a week ago. Yeah. I don't, new heroes. I don't yeah. see how Alliance can take fights. Yeah. It's like the timings, there's those three bolt, big, three huge ulties on the side of NIP. I think Alliance have, they have to come out of lanes really strong and this has to be like this, this kind of like tempo where they're just constantly running at NIP, not letting them like group up and get their like positions to get their ulties off. Cause otherwise I think they're gonna be in so much trouble. And, and they don't necessarily have the laning heroes that do the running at you thing. They don't have like Earth Spirit and Night Stalker. They're sitting on a Necro who's pretty slow. I mean, he can win lanes by all means, but CM, which is pretty S slow. Sven Bristol are the ones Start that kind of just like run at things and with mana. They they they, they mm -hmm. need to be use mana to to get ahead in the lane and then secure themselves a strong mid game. And then they okay. need to avoid these like big crazy team fights. I think they're gonna hit creeps a lot, and I think that's possibly gonna create a game for them where they just kind of sit around and don't do enough. Right. What kind of game do you think we're gonna get? I'm. Um, I mean, I'm. I'm liking NIP. I think they've got great great rush control, great team fight around it too. And yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean. Blitz is wait, wait, wait. Blitz is going to see a Storm Spirit first, yeah. first well, time. We're going to find out what's what? going let's, on. Let's bring in the Storm Spirit expert uh, who sat alongside Cap right now in the commentary box. So, Blitz, this couldn't have been a better setup for you, could it? I have not casted a Storm game <laughs> in maybe like a year. It's been a long time. And I've time. been saying it's like been free Storm games yeah. all the time, yeah. but it's been a garbage hero. I yeah. think it's been a bad is hero Is this for a like good Storm years. game, though? I would say that it's okay because it's, mm. it's quite good against the Death Prophet in some right. ways. Like. It's one of those matchups where they both have different uh, power spikes and right. curves. All right, we'll have to see how they get on. It's all yours, gents. Take us into the game one. Thank you, Paul. Y you know, Blitz, just because you can't win doesn't make it a bad hero, right? It's objectively not a very good hero. For three years? It's been pretty bad, genuinely. Okay, I was talking to Kevin about this, and part of it okay. is because... Uh, oh, man, I could talk ad nauseum about this. <laughs> uh, part of it is because when you made the Remnant switch, it made it really hard for you to get CS in the lane. Mm -hmm. So what you'd have to do against like uh, TA versus Tinker, or TA, Tinker, Lina, all those like really annoying matchups, is you would have to drop a Remnant just to see us. Uh, their base damage is better than yours, and your move speed is so bad that you can't really get into the middle of the creep wave and get out really easily. <laughs> so you had to pretty much do it in like four or five Remnants. Okay. But when they made the mana cost so high, they put it at 100 base, and you have 423, and your base mana regen is only one. That means at max you get like four, four and a half uh, Remnants mm -hmm. per go, which isn't very good. Like For the most part, you're not going to get your bottle off of just that. So it made the laning phase pretty <laughs> miserable for Storms to play. But I think with the change, it makes it a lot easier to go back to just going uh, for more of a pull build. You can like go back to doing the pull build. Remember, like people, are, you can go back to doing stuff like 114 and stuff like that. Mm. OK. It, there's just more diversity to the hero than there used to be, which I think is really cool. And then on top of that, we've got uh, Crystal Maiden, Dream Pairing there if you're going to be that mid storms here what do you think about the rest of the draft from alliance uh we've got this yeah, we necropose, talk about the other for heroes. example uh i think all right so going into alliance's draft first i think that necro i think is a very interesting hero just because uh i think he was pretty bad for a while but you know now he's kind of okay again i think he's really good against these tanky cores that really rely on playing this like half hp based style yeah. which is brewmaster Ursa and uh, Death Prophet, and to a lesser extent, Slardar too, right? Like these tankier heroes that would normally take you longer to kill, but uh, you can't really play the margins as high. And I guess the next step would be, uh, what about side lane Storm Spirit? What because was it? that's what we're going to be having. Koifa is actually going to be playing mid Necrophos against the Death Prophet. What was the Chinese team that was picking it all the time uh, at TI? They were doing off lane Storm? I don't remember. Oh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but they were picking off lane Storm quite a bit. I think it's okay. I can see why they pick Storm in this game, because it's good against the cores. Mm -hmm. And that's really what you're looking for in a Storm Spirit game. Like, whether what determines is how good are the supports? Like, do you scale well against the cores? Like, can the supports catch you? 
are you good against the cores? It's like, you're really nice against both these supports, right? Yeah. Like, Coddle, you don't care about at all. Uh, I guess Brew can be annoying, but not really. Like, the only annoying part is, uh, before, in the past, the Drunken Brawler was actually really annoying to kill him through, because he'd almost always get his ult off, even if you have an Orchid. Right. But nowadays, if you zip in Orchid him, he'll die, because there's no passive uh, mischance. Like, mischance actually really screwed Storm. It made it really hard for you to play against stuff like that. And on the flip side, we should talk about uh, NIP's lineup. I think they have a really strong mid-game timing based around their ultis, but I do think they are very timing-based as Doesn't a lineup. look like they're going to be losing Ace here as Boxy should oh, just be able to run dead. him down. This is the power of Bristleback lately. Everybody's been going for this 1-1-0 one, one, build. PBD dead? And PBD! Yeah, he's not Made yeah. underestimated oh, Boxy. Oh, I love that. Do you see his spacing against the tower? He just kind of kept himself out of range of the tower. Maximum range for the quills. That was so much damage. What? Yeah. I, the thing about it is probably what makes this really cool too is that like I just don't. It's been so long since I played against Bristle, and I'm sure it's uh, a similar case for a lot of people, where you just kind of forget these. You things forget. That, yes. You don't really expect the. Uh, it, it's been a while since anyone's just gone for like one one. Yes. I've been playing Bristleback lately. Oh, the it just feels so good. The Viscous Nasal Goo, level 1, 1. 1.4 armor loss. That is... You're essentially throwing a 1.5 second uh, cooldown wave of terror, right? Oh, top lane, Mickey. Going to be in trouble here. He's going to be able to get a lot of remnant damage onto PBD as well as Ace. Tiger's going to be able to come in, give him that extra physical damage shield, and now Mickey's going to be good. It's going to be Ace who's getting kited around by both Insania and Taiga. He will be able to get out as well. Both cores limping away, but it looks like Mika's going to be the greater for it as he still had a healing self in the bag. Yeah, and this bottom, uh, this bottom lane, the Bristle, looks like he's just going to try to cut the creep wave, and that's why Soxa, who, in my opinion, is one of the best Kava players. What we learned when we worked with him on DC is that you need to give this guy something that clears creep waves. Like, he needs to be able to flash farm, push out waves. Okay. Because, I mean, Soxa is... He's very core-centric. Like, if you ever run into him in pubs, he's a very good pub player. He's always, like, top 10. Yeah. He plays a ton of cores. Yes. As Sox is now going to go down to this, he also doesn't expect the damage in... What like, is happening Or damage here? from the neutral creep. Apparently, the entirety of Ninja's pajamas needs uh, an update on what Bristleback can do. They're just not expecting the uh, the firepower from this hero early on. Yeah. And again, uh, that that's why all these new patches and stuff like that, it's really cool because... You know, it's whoever plays more pubs, the familiarity that you'll have with these heroes. Going to be able to catch PPD. He's getting nice body blocks here from Tiger. That should be able to ensure the kill. Finally, though, Boxy does fall at bottom lane. 33, Slardar managed to get that kill. The melee versus melee matchup, Slardar is tough to beat with that bash. Yeah. Looks and like Boxy was not to the task. You're going to need Boxy to be, if you're alliance, you need him to be a little bit more patient. I watch this guy play a lot, and I think his strength is that he, he makes stuff happen around the map. He's very okay. good at making stuff happen around the map. He's a really active sort of offlaner, but sometimes it's hard for him to turn off that switch. He can't just be aggressive at all times as, as so I say that. So many stacks. Boxy just keeps him slowed down. Another nice crush that's going to ensure more damage. But vision. Boxy should just be able to keep pace with him. Meanwhile, top lane, Ace is going to fall as well. Alliance picking up kills all over the place. But fortunately, Sox is able to get one of the supports. The other is going to fall as well as Death Prophet comes into this top lane, trying to upset what is currently a very favorable status quo for Alliance. Yeah. And that bottom lane is what I'm talking about with uh, Boxies. This guy just kind of makes things happen yeah. around the map. It's just when you have a lead like this, you have to be really careful about uh, giving it up mm. to the other side. It's not just a morale thing. Like It feels really good when you know, even if you lose two supports there, our offlaner is doing excellent. It's important that he continues to do excellent. Like Dota, I think the more and more that I play, like it's a very morale-based game. When you know that one person's doing well, like especially when your cores, your big cores, yeah. it just makes the game feel a lot better as a support. You don't feel as pressure to make moves. Taiga and Insania can just continue to play in this top lane. They don't really have to give him any backup because they know, okay, Boxy's winning that bottom lane. So even if this top lane just sort of trades even, we know that we're at least guaranteed winning one lane. There really is nothing worse than somebody panicking because they're having a bad game and forcing his teammates to do plays that just aren't natural. Yeah, I mean, every pub player can relate to that. When you know you're having your own personal good game and somebody's like, oh, you gotta come help me or, you know, I'm, I'm just He's not, telling supports to gank a lane that, you know, can't actually be ganked. He's, yeah. 
you have to really, in Dota, it's really understanding like where you can and can't put pressure. Mm -hmm. Like this mid lane, it's hard to get a kill on either side. And right. so it's the side lane that you're really going to devote your attention to. But this bottom lane, it's Bristle plus Slardar. Do you really need to give your Bristle any sort of help? And on the flip side, do you really need to give your Slardar any sort of help? Yeah. Like this should be sort of like a net neutral lane, I'd imagine. And so it's going to be this top lane, I'd imagine, uh, whoever makes the first rotation to. But both these cores are sort of immobile. Like Storm's only level four. He's sitting in this uh, safe lane up here, but they don't have kill potential around him. And so for Alliance, it's a lot of just hoping that your si your other two lanes are going well while you sort of just trade evenly. As Koikva is going to be the first to make the move. Got to be able to get that. Reaper Scythe off. Peter. He's such a low low. He's level two. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a 20 <laughs> second play. Even with that extra bit of time, it's nothing to him. You know, check your phone. See what's popping on Twitter. 3d6, an early lead for Alliance, and an early lead for this Bristleback as well. Fada uses the absence of Koifa's Necrophos to try and put some pressure on that mid-tier one. Yeah. But you see this all the time from these uh, mid laners. They'll, they'll go rotate to a side lane, then just TP back to their lane real quick. So they're really not, there's not a huge opportunity for these mid lane pushers like DK and Death Prophet to actually fully take that tower. Oh, right now, I think for Alliance, it's really important that they keep this top tower alive for as long as possible and this mid tower alive for as long as possible. As they're going to make a go onto Ace, and I mean, this is not supposed to be a kill. They're just going to do it with a level 5 storm. And because I told you, the uh, the change, you can get that early level in Vortex that before oh, you would skip Koifa entirely. Being run down by Fauna. This is going to be a massive kill. He can actually get it. The Crypt Swarm, not quite enough. The Spirit Siphon will be enough to finish him off. Fada. Runs him down underneath the tier one tower alliance, putting so much pressure on these lanes. But Boxy is going to be in trouble here. Is that minus armor? Oh, he's actually getting so many quills. Might be able to get to trade off here. 33 gets a little low, but it's not quite. He had seven out. stacks on him. That was so much. I think one more probably would have done the trick. Okay, managed to get in melee range here. PPT, thanks to the stun from Taiga, gets a lot of damage in. Soxa pushes them back, and Peter. Is he actually still going to get caught? One last remnant hit, not going to be there from Mickey. Just barely not level 6. Yeah, this uh, creep wave will be able to get him, finally. At level 6 is good to go. I think what I'd like uh, right now is for the Storm to jungle out his mana, or cause, or you can even go for the top shrine, smoke with your two supports, and make a move on a Fada. Okay. Because I, I think you want to try to delay the timing of this Death Prophet as much as humanly possible. Do you I think... Like, by ganking him, you're going to slow down him taking those towers. You said it was really important for Alliance to keep their mid tier one and their safe lane tower. Yeah, alive. because if Why you look that? at Alliance's lineup uh, or NIP's lineup, it's very timing based. And one of those timings, when you have these sort of like all inish lineups where you have a lot of push potential uh -huh. and you have these mid game cores like DP, Slardar, and Ursa, this Roshan becomes more and more important. It right. just becomes really big that the first Roshan of the game, you do it early enough around like the 17, 18 minute mark, so that by the time the second run rolls around, it's around the 30 minute mark, and you hit into this timing where you can go for the high ground and minimum try to take a rise. One stun, two stun, 33, significantly slowed down at Ace. Can't really do anything to help him out. If anything, he may be the victim of more Quill Spray. He's actually managed to get the stun with Corrosive Ace as well. Fada coming in, will be able to clean him up. That is just so much physical damage with the Corrosive Haze minus armor and the Ghosts out. Taiga shouldn't be able to get away either unless he can somehow find a way out through these <laughs> trees. But the Ghosts, they can chase you down even without vision. The Ghosts just know where you are. And that's what I'd like to see. Uh, I would have liked to see Mickey try to make a rotation in, but Fada's playing really well right now. Like the rotation to go down to a side lane at bottom, mm -hmm. uh, just a good move overall. They're going to finally give PPD some space in this mid lane too. Like he desperately needs it. He's only level three, doesn't have boots. I know we're used to seeing PPD in uh, Povertyville, but this is, this is a bit extreme. Yeah, and I'm not sure if uh, you can really afford for a brewmaster to be this poverty level. Yeah, this is some real, like, minimum wage Dota. You gotta at least be able to get off your ultimate in some of these team fights. Koifa is gonna go for the Gale here. It's not gonna be fast enough. Won't be able to get Soxa, the Corrosive Haze, onto Koifa, and he oh, does not have good. Ghost Shroud yet, so... The move to just be there, too. That is really weird. Yeah, now his team gonna make a rotation down to this bottom lane. And it's really Mickey that you need to see start getting aggressive. I think he's waiting on his Kaya, but really, it's not the Necro that makes the easy rotations to get kills. It's going to be the Storm Spirit. 
What an awkward, like, very greedy gank. Yeah. Just to uh, go into the enemy's offlane jungle that early while the tier 1s on both sides are still up. I mean, even that bottom dive that they made originally was odd. That, yeah. That's what I'm talking about with Boxy, is you've got to be make, making sure that you don't just trade off kills like that. It's not worth it when uh, you're one of the highest net worth heroes on your team, especially being as tanky as he is. Yeah. We used to call it uh, on Likudu, it was like strongman syndrome, where you overrate because you're playing a Timbersaw or a Bristleback, you're like, I'm unkillable, they won't even go for you. <laughs> yeah. But the thing about Dota is it's so punishing as a game that you always just die to anything. Like, three heroes come down, they will kill you. Vada. First tower for uh, Ninja Pajamas. It's going to be here in this top lane. Looks like Alliance are going to give it up. They are centered around mid right now. This is quite nice for them, uh, for Alliance, if they can take this mid tower, especially playing against a Coddle this early on, because this should be the move that uh, NAP wants to make. So I'd imagine everyone just starts TPing here and they start counter pushing the mid tower. They've got DPL for this. I'd like to see everybody from NIP come for this one. Do you think Alliance takes that fight? Yes. You think they, they play that fight? I don't on think five? you can afford because you've given up, given up this top tower like up here. You've given up. Look at the ward vision centered around two. This is protecting for the Roshan. Yeah. If you take this mid tower, all of a sudden you don't have vision all along this area. It makes it really difficult for you to do anything. And that's why you see everybody from NIP smoke, but they're actually just going to go for the wraparound play themselves. So they did all make the full rotation with the exception of the Ursa, and they're going to connect to him, and they're going to run to where they have ward vision. And hopefully after they get this kill, the idea is you immediately go for some sort of play, but there's a DD Storm Spirit, and that could be the game changer here. Vada's pushing in that mid lane, so with this big long wraparound, they will be able to catch someone here. It's going to be Taiga. It is just a support, so Alliance really don't have to invest too much. Yeah, but you're going to lose. Watch, pop the pop the ulti, the exorcism, and now Roshan, you have to constantly check on it. Mm. And if you check on Alliance, I think they just use their scan. But isn't this the classic, isn't this where Bristleback is supposed to come in? Isn't he supposed to be the big tower defender yes, for you? I agree. I think you have to all-in commit for this tower, because I think if you give up on this tower, uh, you're going to give up on Rosh. And if you give up on Rosh, then you're essentially conceding the mid game. Right. You're not fighting against NIP's lineup with an Aegis on their side. Right on time. Boxy shows up. Yeah. This this has to be the, the goal of the game. Keep the mid tower alive as long as possible. That's why NIP made that huge investment. Because it doesn't really matter who you kill at that point. It's just that you get a kill, you try to transition it into a tower. It's just that they weren't willing to blow Fata's exorcism because they saw the TP in. <laughs> that was an optimistic gank. That was a storm spirit with a lot of mana. You yep. would have to really screw up to be caught by two melee heroes. And he's the game changer in this, because they don't really have the easiest way to catch him. At some point, I'd imagine if you get a BKB, you're not really killable mm -hmm. until Ursa gets something like a Basher. But Storm has a really hard time with these mid-game fights without yep. one. And so and that's, that's where the Bristleback comes in, right? Yeah. He's so strong in the mid-game, he's going to cover that weakness. This is where like lineups like this uh, make sense. Like you, you start to see like why people pick the way that they did. Jump in, Mickey actually had a double damage, but uh, Fada is going to be just fine. He's got a Yule Scepter. PPD is going to be forced to use his ultimate. Boxy forced that one out of him. Mickey is going to be able to catch that Slardar. Deals a lot of damage to him with Reaper Scythe coming in. That's going to cut him down very easily. Alliance once again finding the the right for the fight Look at for this arrow drawn too. They're saying, let's take mid-tower ourselves. Ooh, but not a box. He overextends himself. Yule Scepter. Nice Yules. And that's going to be uh, that's gonna be a wasted ultimate for Death Prophet. Man, Boxy really, uh, he plays the margins. <laughs> uh, it's always really, it's scary to watch this guy play. It's uh -huh. really exciting because, you know, he just goes for it. There's no fear. But sometimes you're like, dude, a little bit of pullback. But that move by Alliance to take that mid-tower, that was brilliant. Uh, it just seems like... They're kind of in motion. They had two heroes distract off. They peeled the heroes from NIP off, thinking there was going to be a major team fight up at top. You saw the Death Prophet exorcism committed, and this is going to continue to extend the game for them. So now, as long as you can defend your mid tower, now you have control of the Rosh pit area. Yeah. Now it's NIP that have to place the defensive wards around that. And you don't have to take Rosh on yourself, right? Like there's, it would be nice to be able to get Bristle back. He could certainly do it, but you know, get a, an Aegis for a Storm Spirit. But it takes them a lot longer. That's outperforming your yes. your lineup, right? Exactly. The fact that they were able to take the mid tower first, I think, is going to put them in a really good position. Is Taiga going to go for the CP out? There is the Yules, though, on Fada, and this will be just an easy pickup. Yeah, I don't know if Taiga thought he was going to get Will O Wisp to be used by Soxa or something, but. I optimism. Can't be cynical in this world, Austin. Mm. You got to stay positive at all times. 
I myself don't follow that. I was about to say, you're a very cynical person. Yeah, but you know, I love Dota at least. Like, nothing else, but... It's like, I, I have a, you know, though, I just have this, like, intense hate for myself and everything. Uh -huh. But Dota, oh, I love Dota. I don't know, man. I, I've, 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 I've sat behind you watching you play pubs. There's uh, not yeah, a whole but, lot of love there. Yeah, but the thing about it is, like, you sort of love it. Uh, you know that, like, self... You love uh, the hate? Yeah, it's like the self-flagellation. It's like, you know, I, I dive into that pain. Every Dota player is, like, a little bit masochistic. There's like, there's like a 30% chance somebody's gonna ruin my game and I still opt to play. What kind of... <laughs> now just imagine you like, I have sinned, I must go play Dota for my... Can you imagine telling a normal human being about, oh, all that thought is Ace. He's gonna get jumped on here. He's just, they're just doing the kite job around him. He still has his ulti, trying to wait for it to pop. He's now PPD's come up. Now he's gonna let it go as the Will-O-Wisk gets dropped down too and he pushes him away from Ace. They're going to be able to get him out here, and PPD is going to make sure that uh, at least any goes down. And in fact, our Bristleback now with the Cross of Haze as well. Oh, Spirit Siphon, he's got to just. They've just, just got to leave him behind because now the Necrophos oh, make Ace actually going to go for the back line. He's going to be able to catch Ace, will be able to catch him out, bring him down. So it makes the fight a little bit better for them, but it's still two for one in the favor of Ninja's pajamas. Still, they've, uh, they've denied NIP this mid-game timing. They still kept their mid-tower alive. They haven't given up Roche. Yeah, this all these the fights haven't resulted in an objective yes. for Nip, right? Like, they, they should be wanting to be able to take a team fight, then boom, we take this mid-tower, we take this Roche on or something, but none of that's happening. Koifa, Koifa opting to try and go for that Brewmaster kill, but that was so just so making you take Koifa. Damage. Insania, well, he does manage to get the Reaper Scythe off. It's not quite enough to kill the Slardar. In fact, Insania, that I think was, he just frostbit the wrong target there, too. That was so ambitious from Koikva. Yeah. That's twice now that we've seen him just overrate how tanky he can potentially be, is now the rest of Alliance filtering in, but NIP doing a very good job. They are out of there. Now the 4K lead that you had, just a little bit of sloppiness. Alliance has played a very good game up until that moment, I'd say. Mm -hmm. As there's going to be a drum I'm here. Sasa misses. Sasa. He is so dead. Yeah, he's very dead. And that tower you think you could rush might here? be dead, too. If you uh, skip this creep wave, take the tower, you have Roche potential now. Yeah, with the Brewmaster ultimate still on cooldown, too. Oh, they're going to fort, but this is uh, it's a bit too late. Oh, nice catch. 33 with an early blink dagger. The follow-up silence from Fada. You're gone. So they had good vision on him. And remember that defensive ward because they lost that tier one tower. Koifa didn't opt to try and go for the deny. What do you think about uh, the Storm Spirit's build? The, the Kaya, no no Yule Scepter or anything to try and, you know, deal with this silence that Death Prophet has? I think this is okay. It's just you can't, uh, you have to be real far back playing around where you have ward vision. And look, as soon as they take the mid tower, this is what happens. You're going to lose the Roshan. This is what Alliance were trying to delay. I thought it happened around 17 minutes, but it's going to happen even sooner than that. And now you're just going to see them run it. Uh, will o -Wiss is going to be able to catch Koifa, gets him on the second phase as well, pulling him back in. The Ghost Shroud's going to be able to buy him a little bit of time, but that's Spot. quickly dispelled by the Storm Panda from the Brewmaster. Insania, nice ultimate here. That's going to be able to push the rest of Ninja's pajamas that's back. That's 20 armor, baby. They can't fight into that, especially not when he's, uh, he's not even visible. It's the naked eye. Nice use of that Shadow Amulet pickup. Still, for Alliance, this is the exact situation that they wanted to avoid. And that all starts with Mickey getting caught out by this ward right here. Mm -hmm. Once He sort of has to anticipate that, though. We talked about how uh, NIP is going to play some sort of defensive ward around their mid area because they know, okay, we can't give up Roche on ourselves, so that Storm, they can do it with Bristle, and we've lost our mid tower. See from the GG bets that this... It's a pretty even match so far. And it's, uh, it's going to swing a little bit further in the favor of Nip if they can actually bring down this Brewmaster, which, of course, that Ursa can once he starts getting some of those uh, those stacks. Popsy and Rage with the Corrosive Haze as well. It doesn't matter if you've got that passive Bristle back. You've got the uh, Storm Killer now, too, which is the Ursa with Basher. Mm. It's really hard as a Storm to survive against him once he has that. There's this weird timing window where you just keep getting killed as they're gonna make the run onto Insania as they are gonna find him easily under the sentry ward as we hear the zip in from the storm, but Fada already has that Aeon disc. Yeah, Fada's really farmed right now. Nine, zero, and two. Didn't even see how well he was doing. Do you like the Aeon disc? Oh, I think it's really good. 
Because the only thing that kills you against Storm, the problem with playing against Storm oftentimes is uh, even if you have a Yule Scepter, you just get popped because you have a, something like 1200 health. And so you get this uh, you get this Aeon Disc and no matter what, you'll be able to get your toolkit off, which yeah. is so important against Storm. Like so many times I've been playing DP against Storm, you just get zipped on, half your health is gone, you get pulled, your team can't really save you. Even if you Yules, by the time you uh, start dropping everything, you just die. And but this is... It's NIP's time now. Just get aggressive everywhere on the map. Take whatever fights you want. You've got Aegis. You want to try to grab at least two tier two towers with this. Set up for the next Roshan because you have so much map control. Get that one, and that'll be your game ender. But the long zip into the top lane. So far from Ace. Him. He's all by himself. He may have the Aegis, yes, but there's no towers. DP2, Nip, they're trying to make their way down the river, but they're just going to be so far away. Ace does still have the enrage. His team is just and about to join him. They're going to be able to get the two-man crush with the back on with Will Wiss as well, catching all four. Ace tries to turn around, but is locked in still by Mickey. He's able to get a little bit more damage onto that bristle back with the Spirit Siphon as well. Nip are just just running over all of Alliance now. That Bristleback cannot get away fast enough. He's going to be bashed up by Ace, caught by Fada. That's two down from Alliance. They thought they had the time. And honestly, I thought they had the time too. There was no towers to TP2. I thought Nip were too far away to be able to get there for that second life of the Ursa. That Slardar sprint in the river, you just, uh, you really underestimate how quickly he was able to get up there. Yeah. And he, he hits the two-man stun, Soxa follows up with the will o -Wisp, and then he continues to isolate two heroes by himself, effectively cutting off uh, any sort of help that's gonna come on Jump in, that's a Reaper's side, 33, gone already, and another one in Brewmaster. Soxa gonna be slowed down as well, gets the pushback on Mickey, that missed percentage chance you said earlier. It really hurts a Storm Spirit, and we see it there, allowing Keeper of the Light to be able to get away. Yeah. Very well done, though, by Alliance. Now they're recognizing, like, whatever, whenever we see anybody split up, we just have to take fights. Mm. This is what I like about their moves right now. I think they're playing very well in that regard. They're seeing heroes, and they're making decisive decisions. Just sometimes, I think their only difficulty is knowing, did we go too far? Like, is this actually a kill? Right. I mean, I agree with their decision to go for that top play. I also thought they would have gotten the kill in the first place. So I, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, and the mid play is very nice by them, too. Like, NIP is just not expecting the speed at which Alliance is willing to play right now. You show it here on the map, Alliance runs at you. Now, how does Alliance counteract that? Now, they've kind of got a feel for what Nip want to be able to do. They're just kind of running at heroes nonstop. Oh, you mean Nip? Uh, you want to gather up. If you're NIP, okay. you finally want to gather up. You have to say to yourselves, like, it's not worth it for one person to show on one side of the map and connect. Just go together, and that's exactly what they're doing. And they're going to run into Taiga, who is probably one of the worst targets to run into. This yeah, they don't. Alliance don't care about this big off. Because now the Storm's going to push in this bottom lane. You have to respond to that, in my opinion anyways, because look at how far this creep wave is along for them. They're not going to get the top tower as a trade. So somebody's going to come down here and respond, and this is going to force NIP to just sort of dissolve. As they'll know that uh, this brew is solo mid. Yeah, they see someone bottom. They see someone top and mid. A lot of split up here. We'll see where Alliance choose to uh, try and catch somebody out. They're actually going to just back away. And this is the benefit of having chill. a storm on your team is that you can continuously make uh, these sorts of nice. plays. They decided to run it top. Ace, the Crystal Maiden got the vision. Hey, everyone's in this mid lane. I was able to TP out. Oh, just run at the that ult. Ursa. The Enrage is going to run out, and the Reaper's side will be able to get that kill. Taiga is going to be able to prevent that bounty rune from being picked up. Koifa just jumping in fearlessly, maybe because, you know, he still had a little bit of that regen left over from that hero kill on the Ursa. 70 seconds on his death timer as well. So plenty of time for Alliance to play aggressive if they want. And this is what they need to do, is force one side of the map with the Storm Spirit. When somebody goes to respond to that, when your Alliance, just jump on whoever you see. Any core you see, any opportunity you see, just go for it. You have to extend the game. And you have to make it difficult. You have to get farmed enough so that the next Roshan fight can potentially go in your favor. Because that'll be, in my opinion, what determines the game. If your alliance can pick up a good fight around this Roche pit, you get Aegis Cheese on that storm. It's going to be really hard to take down an Aegis Storm Cheese uh, Bristle or Necro. Yeah. Like those are some of the. They have such good uh, cheese holders on their team. They, they have really Bristle, do. Necro, Storm. Any of them will be really effective with it. And you put an Aegis on a Storm Sphere to begin with. I mean, we just saw the the storm sphere was top lane, and Nip did not feel comfortable going on that bristleback with the necrophos behind him. It's a different situation because it's so much easier for 
Alliance to get the jump than it is for uh, NIP. NIP strength is always going to be going for the five man. Mm -hmm. But if you get outmaneuvered, somebody always pushes in top lane, somebody always pushes in bottom way, wave, it, it makes it hard for you to make any sort of decisions on the map because you just continuously get split. And at the same time, you don't want to be together as five consistently roaming anywhere because even if you get one pick off, it doesn't lead to anything because all of a sudden you have a storm, he pushes in this top lane, you send four heroes up there to deal with him, and it just keeps resetting over and over. And it'll just keep resetting the balance of the game. And now all the of a sudden... The game gets stalled out. Yeah. All of a sudden you've got this big item like the BKB on Storm. And that's what you need to do is consistently just... If you're Alliance, force out these waves. Play this old school Alliance strat. I mean, this goes back to like Bulldog times. <clears throat> Maybe that's where Coach Loda coming in. It's like, guys, just split up the just map. Split, just, you'll be fine. You... <laughs> I want a TI like that. You don't got to make any... And it does kind of feel like Nip, they really can't afford another pickoff like that. The Reaper Scythe, I mean, it was so much time. The Storm Spirit's like a thousand gold away from BKB. Once he gets that, this game's going to become yeah. very difficult. I love games like this, by the way. It's like where, you know, there's a very clear stylistic difference. Mm. Like one team has push, one team has who's got to execute better. Yeah. Because that's what it comes down to is who executes uh, better. And right now, Alliance, like, even though they've had one or two moments, you know, as long as they can avoid these sloppy five on fives, it's like they'll be okay. But they just can't get into these five on fives because this is where NIP strong. Look at them. They go for the five man. They're tired of it. They're slick. All right, we're just going to go for a smoke. But these side lanes are being pushed in again. And so Alliance knows something is up. So everyone's hiding. Yeah. They're like, well, if no one comes to deal with the side lanes, then we know for a fact. The more damage that tier two bottom is taken, the more obvious it is. It is so obvious that they are point. smoked around mid. Yeah, I mean, look at Insania. Like, he's been pushing in this top lane with the ward for the past, like, three minutes. He doesn't care. So they're going to go for the Roshan instead. I think this is their best play. This is the only way that they can really make something happen on the map. Because now this makes your push dangerous. Yeah. If you go for a 5 man with Aegis and Cheese, you don't feel as if you're so all-in. And your all-in feels a lot stronger to begin with. Meanwhile, Alliance, they know that Nip's been doing that. Do you think they're they're okay with the trade-off? They're like, you can have the Aegis, but uh, us being able to get the Tier 2 bottom lane, just be able to push out the lanes, which is naturally going to stall the game for a few more minutes as well. Oh, nice. Good timing, good timing. I think that it's just, it's like net neutral. Maybe, I, I think it is NIP favored. NIP probably feel really good about that. Because suddenly it resets the clock for them a little bit. Mm. Like the pace of the game is not favoring them at all. And now being able to get the Aegis and Roche, it sort of puts more control back in your hands. Because now if you go for a five man, you have to respect it. They will go high ground on you. And so this is exactly what they're going to look for here. Foxy pops out maybe a little bit too far forward. They're yeah, going to try and save him here. They managed to get the Sven shield. Just doesn't matter, though. The Ursa is tearing apart Boxy bit by bit with those swipes building up. And they actually start losing. Oh, no. Are you Boxy? Can he actually outrun this? 33 is going to no. be able to hit him with another blink. They and more Sentry and more now. damage coming in from Fada. He's living for so long. Alliance, Boxy. they're somehow <laughs> keeping Boxy alive for so long. Finally, he does go down. And finally, Ninja Pajamas will be able to take that mid tier two. I don't think so. They have no creep wave. Oh, they don't? Because they. <laughs> Did they the strike about so What happened? Yeah. Uh, when he went for Sox in the first place, Make it just clear the creep wave. And so okay. they're pinging for this top tower, but. They might even get people online quick enough. It's 30 seconds until the bristle. You probably lose this tier two, but you won't lose anything more out of this. Yeah. And it's all about delay now. I think the mistake Alliance made right there was thinking they, were, they could fight in the first place. Uh -huh. Just push out the lanes, deal with everything later, continue the cycle of the game. It's been working out for you. The only time Alliance has struggled in this game is when they went for the straight up 5 on 5s. They've got a 2,000 net worth lean, Taiga. Not sure what he's doing up here, but uh, PPD, the detective that he is on the case, is going to be able to find that support. This hit in from Mickey. Alliance are going to take this five on five underneath their tier two. Soxa immediately being targeted down. He's going to force out that Will of Wisp. Mickey is going to try and deal with that to make sure his other cores don't have to deal with that. Disable will be able to jump away as he kills the Will of Wisp. Gets stunned by 33. The Cross of Ace on him as well. Has the to be able to bash the They're going to be okay. And they're standing inside the freezing field as well. Ace turns around, thinks about going for Insane. He realizes he can't do oh, that what either. A this fight is a disaster for Nip. That's going to be the Aegis down with the Broom. Master Cobb with the Yule Scepter. They're going to make sure he can't TP away. Ace has nowhere to run to either. Certainly can't TP out in front of that Crystal Maiden. Oh, tries might... to go for this Fen kill. Can't even get that. Looks like they uh, left PPD. No, they know. They, they know, they know he's still there. They're like, ah, oh, you can up. run away. You got nowhere. You can actually hide. Oof. That freezing field by Insania. 
just cuts the field in half. So what happened there? But you were talking about like, hey, you don't need to take out these five on fives. Why did Alliance take that? And why did it go so well? Uh, Fada didn't have ulti. Mm. That was the main thing. Just straight up. <laughs> it's still a cooldown dependent lineup. Still very cooldown dependent lineup. I think NIP just probably got frustrated. They're like, we have to do something with this Aegis yeah. cheese. Let's like, make something happen. We popped it mid. Let's take that, that yeah. top lane. I don't necessarily even think that was like, I, I understand their reasoning. It was just Alliance, very good jumps. The team fight was really well executed. Mickey being able to jump Soxa first, I think he realizes like this guy is really annoying in team fights. Once my BKB fades, his blinding light is causing a lot of issues for me. They get the fight onto him first. They make it hard for NIP to fight right after that. So it's not just a stupid blunder from Nip. They feel very pressured yes. about this game, right? And that's why they're like, damn it, we got to get an objective somewhere in here. We got to take that tier two. If you're not going to make a move like that as a five man, even without the deep heal, you're kind of put in a weird position as you see again, the freezing field, it went on for full duration, I think. And they were just completely under the tier two tower. Mickey being able to find Soxa first. They did such a good job of just isolating hero after hero. They played this fight perfectly. I think that was just really well done by Alliance. Yeah. And I think NIP is having their moments in this game too. It's just the sort of limitations with their draft and being able to catch people. Like, their lineup was very much geared around taking fights. I think losing the Tier 1 tower um, first really hurt them. It delayed the Roshan timing. It just made things a lot more awkward, and it just bought Alliance a lot more time and pressure. Quite quite far. Far. They know he's hiding somewhere in 33. Spots him for a moment. Couldn't get hit in. Oh, he doesn't have Blink up. Oof. Unfortunate. It's a fun game to watch, though. That would have been a great pickoff. That could have led them taking the Tier 1 off lane, as the lane was already pushing in, too. The long oh, the long zip in. Vada is going to be forced to pop his BKB. Also loses his Aeon Disc cooldown well as well. It. It's that DD Storm potential. And that's why yeah. this is now the power curve in favor of Storm. Because you don't care about the silence. You'll always get the BKB off. Right. And you can get that instant burst onto that DP now. Once he gets that side, even Slardar, Ursa. Yeah, now you're seeing, uh, they know that the PKB is down. They know that the disc is down. They want to make an aggressive play. The DD is still there for a few more seconds. As Mickey, he has his BKB, the rest of the team filtering in. Here we go. This would be massive, but PPD, he's going to be the one spots him first. Might be able to get off his ultimate first in the Reaper side. And oh, he's going to get it off. off. He managed to get that as well as the Storm Fury getting bashed. That is a big swing for Ninja the Pajamas. Two massive upsets, and Alliance are now just going to get picked apart. They thought they were getting a fight that they wanted. They thought they were going to be able to take a fight to Ninja's Pajamas with these clutch cooldowns, and it just turns into utter disaster for them. They're going to lose all three of their cores. <laughs> Did you see what happened when uh, Mickey jumped? So he went for Soxa again, yeah, yeah. but this time, <laughs> Soxa had literally four heroes standing on top of, or three heroes. Uh -huh. So the DP was up front, and the other two melee cores were just bodyguarding him, like just burly dudes. <laughs> Protect Soxa at all costs. At all costs. Clap emojis. They just <laughs> they just actually stood right on top of him. So when he zipped in with his BKB, he got bashed immediately, just died in two seconds. Yeah, yeah that's gotta be uh that's gotta be pretty difficult playing Storm Spirit against Slardar. Just for the whole entire game, he has that guaranteed bash he may have prepped up. Yeah. And Mickey was he was going based on his understanding of the last fight. When I killed Soxa, the yeah. fight was easy. Right, right. But the cool thing about Dota is that you get the ability to adapt. Mm -hmm. NIP was like, when they kill Soxa, we lose the fight. <laughs> so this time they were like, we are going to protect his life. Very well done by them. Just a really nice back and forth game we have so far. Soxa. You know, I was, I was talking to uh, a couple players and they were talking about like Coddle and the idea we'll see that replay again of that last team fight. Oh, I wish we got to go a little bit further back to see uh, the protection squad. Yeah. As well as... Uh, them underestimating how tanky PPD was or something, because they they tried to burst him down with the Reaper Scythe and everything, and he still managed to get off that ult. 2200 HP and uh, when you get the Drunken Brawler off, it's quite nice. Yeah. I mean, he was just in the perfect spot. Right as they're coming in for that gank, he actually pops out Taiga. 
Well, he may not be the perfect spot himself here. The rest of his team is nearby, but it looks like they're just going to give up. He actually popped the God Strength as well as the Shrine. He goes for the back line. Once there's again, again. found Soxa, but there goes the back. Ace, Ace is going to try to rip apart Will-O-Wiz. Not going to be able to catch Mickey. He's able to jump himself away. Boxy cannot stop PPD from getting off that ultimate. No disables there. Alliance start limping their way backwards, but Nip do have the catch to be able to hold Boxy in place, but it looks like the rest of the team can't really follow this one up. Nice micro. Nice micro managed to get the, the storm wrapped up in a storm of his own, trying to get that Earth Panda away and blinking out, but he's... Oh, oh the Glimmer Cape. Maybe Look at how annoying he is. Into the high ground. Alliance, are they willing to just follow? You got to back out of here. In there and, yeah, they're Just reset. Back up. Reset the fight. Look at that. You see every time now, Ace has learned. He's like, Soxa, you're the real core. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I'm going to sit right on top of you, and it's making such a difference in fights. Foxy. Always positioning himself. Daring Soxa him to go on him first because if anybody shows, Mickey's ready. You can see with his double damage. Boxy really wants Ninja the Pajamas to take this one. Now the jump in from Mickey. Tries to go, tries to find anybody. He's not going to be able to find anything at all. He thought maybe a support was somewhere to the left. He's going to be able to finally get a catch here. Death Prophet. Oh, that's going to be. She's going nice off the Now turns around with the BKB. Pops that exorcism. And now it's Alliance just trying to get as many heroes out of here as possible because they know they cannot fight into that exorcism. System. Both Sven as well as Bristle back down in Ninja's pajamas. The halfway mark of this game, ready to run down mid. So well done. And that all starts from being able to save Soxa in the first place. Soxa is able to save PPD as a result. Then when they go for the re-engage, you have a full five on uh, five. You're very strong in that regard. Fada baits out perfectly with the cheese. Yeah. The timing of that into the BKB. And that's the problem with playing against uh, this Death Prophet. If you don't burst them initially, things like that do happen to you. These are still fights happening far away from the dire side. Yes. Base. And that is a big problem because you can see Fada, his exorcism just didn't last long enough for them to go for a tier three with it still up. And it's going to be a gruel. If they think they can take down this tier three easily without exorcism, It'd be quite mistaken, especially against the Storm Spirit, who is going to get a little bit more damage on Afana, trying to force a response from Ninja's Pajamas with a side vice. Coming in from Sox, is going to be able to burst down that Storm Spirit with the help of Ursa. Now they go for the next one. That's going to be the Necrophose. The Ghost Shroud's going to wear out eventually. PPD always making sure he gets that Storm Panda Dispel. Oh, my. To get rid of that Ethereal State. They just had to be patient for three seconds, and all five heroes are going to be up. They do have the buybacks available. Okay, telling him 350 cast range for the Keeper of the Light. That Scythe of Vice is so scary on him. From such a long range, Willowis is going to be able to catch three of them. That could be massive. Managed to push the support back in. Couldn't actually get the second swing in. Crystal Maiden actually being protected here pretty decently. Now the jump back in from Mickey as well as quite for the double buybacks. They need to get more out of this. They're going to be able to get PPD. Yes, that's going to be one support down. Ace Cash, they came back in for the Lotus Sword. He managed to get the Abyssal Blade back down, but it doesn't matter. Mickey still falls, and that is 100 seconds. 100 seconds where Ninja Pajamas might be able to finish off this game real nice and easy. They've lost two, though, and now it's is uh, limping along. Boxy is still at half health, trying to kite Ace away, just keep him slowed down, but out of those grasping claws of the Ursa, we'll be able to get him eventually. They want more. They're pinging Fada. They're saying, we have to get this kill at least. The Hex is there. Sox are trying to buy him time. Doesn't want to die himself. Seeing what he can do in the area, this would be Fada's first death. As he's he's going to pop the and go back, back up. He can turn around. Koifa, as well as Boxy. Trying to get away from that Spirit Siphon, but the Exorcism, I mean, he's all by himself. He can't go for high ground. He can't go for any objectives with this. And yeah, they're going to reset themselves. Now this is where the third Roshan of the game is going to be so crucial. Mm. Being able to get a double Keeper, the Ult Light, the Will-O-Wisp. I know they don't uh, do the normal stacks anymore. Yeah. The flickers uh, coincide with each other. But getting a second Death Prophet ult off, we saw how big the cheese was. I mean, you could you could still put it on the Keeper of the Light, right? You yeah. could have two different will o Wisp, but also double Scythe. That is not too bad either. Soxa is just making these fights so annoying for Alliance to play. And it's just so funny to watch a core just completely protect him. You just see Ace on him at all times. Yeah. Just like, they've locked arms, they've, they're doing the buddy system. Soxa feels very protected in these fights, so he gets like four hexes off every engagement. Yeah. And 7 thousand gold lead now for Ninja's Pajamas, but a dead even game, really. What's going to make the difference here is I think Alliance knows that they can't fight Aegis Cheese. 
Aegis Cheese Refresher would mean the end of them. And so they, they should all in for this Roshan. They know there's no Slardar buyback, so there's some weird timing window where you could potentially win this. And Death Prophet Ult is still on CD for a little bit. It's 60 seconds to go. I think you potentially just try to all in this, force a fight. And this is one of those easy Roshan setups where you could just put a hero like Bristle back in there. He's red, he's angry. And force Nip to try and go inside the pit and initiate on a very tanky core. The rest of the team of Lions could just stick around on the high ground. Yeah, and the longer this takes, though, uh, the more time you're just giving NIP to get their cooldowns back up. It's 25 seconds until Fada has his ulti. He's saving for buyback in case he has to go for the Shrine TP. But they're all playing around this mid area. I think there's no, uh, there's absolutely no way that uh, Alliance gives up that Aegis. Like, it, it's akin to losing the game anyways. Haste rune and Fada may get another haste out of his level 25 talent that's coming in quite soon. That could be an important pickup because he could just easily stay ahead of that Bristleback and Necrophos. Necro's 25 isn't really that game changing. No. Storms is if you get Ags. You get Heartstopper or... Uh, or not Ags. Uh, if you got the Electric Vortex at 20, but... Both teams filtering around this Roshan area. Like we said, Alliance understand the importance of this. They put the Crows of Haze on Roshan. And here's the jump. They're going to be able to jump on a Boxy, and he managed to get in front of him too. Boxy taking so much damage oh, from your Ace. Lotus That's going to be his BKB, and he does not have the buyback either. Oof. They're just going to go for Roshan and try to end the game now. I yeah, think. Taiga. He'll fall as well here, and Storm Spirit is immediately just trying to push out the mid lane. He knows they have to give up on Roshan now. He's just got to try and buy as much time as possible. The worst part about this, too, is because Boxy didn't go for the immediate buyback. They know he doesn't have it. Yeah. Because we just talked about how important Roshan is. Yeah. You know, if you're not buying back for that fight, when the rest of your cores don't have buyback anyways, you probably just uh, you don't have it. He was 100 gold away from it, too. And Sania. Not too many support items that come in really clutch, but this one might. Uh, four staff coming in next for him. Oh, you can see 33. How this Ursa is. Nice juke. Dyer's bottom shrine. But it's away to the side shot. TP's they gave it to. Back. Wait, who'd they give the. Uh, PVD actually has the refresher. Interesting. Okay. I also figured you'd give, it to, uh, you'd give it to the Coddle. I really like the idea of the double hex, double will o wisp. Yeah. Even uh, the Ursa's not bad at it either. Double BKB, double Enrage, uh, double Abyssal. It's a lot. I would have figured that uh, PPT might have been the last person he gave it to. He did just give it away to somebody. Who did he give it to? <laughs> Maybe that's his... The Death Prophet? Maybe that's his part as a captain. The backpack? You have to give him the items, and then he decides who to dole it out to. <laughs> you must curry his favor. Nipper gonna finish off that. Uh, well, actually, he's not the last outer tower. We still have a tier two in top lane as well. Everyone's just making their arguments for who gets it. I mean, if I'm Soxa, I'm demanding. It. I mean, Fada, he has an arcane rune, so there's no reason not to pop that exorcism. Start getting some damage on the tier three right now with a scythe as well as that haste. I mean, who could really target a great Lotus Sword from Boxy? He's gonna be able to bounce back that Abyssal Plate once again onto Ace. Now, Mickey tried to jump to the back line, trying to get some damage onto Peter Pan Dam, but knows he can't really commit. But the Reaper Scythe is gonna be able to cut down Ace. That's gonna be the Aegis. A beautiful Will O Wisp that pushes back Mickey into oh, the second swing, too. And Mickey almost gets downed by the Ursa. Will be able to jump away. Didn't get bashed up again, but it's gonna be Boxy in trouble. He has um Ursa problems for sure. Peter just controlling up these heroes in the back line, allowing the rest of Ninja's pajamas to be the able to three get man stun. They managed to get a beautiful three-man stun. The follow-up thing with the blast as well. Fada has that extra refresher shard. It finally comes into play. He's going to pop it now and will have a second exorcism inside this fight. But Alliance just keep on playing in and out of that fountain with the Storm Spirit. But Taiga and Koifa, they're still going to go down. Ace they is getting the real Storm Spirit. He finally comes in now to be able to finish off Ace. That's great. But the rest of the team is still out. There's only three of them defending against the four Ninja's pajamas. And now Mickey has been inside the fight. They're trying to focus him down. Magic of the Silence, Corrosive Haze as well. Mickey is going to fall. No buyback there. It's just Boxy and Insania against four of Nip. 
so well done by Fada. I mean, we haven't talked about this guy enough in this matchup. 14-0 and 15. He has led the way for his team. He just jumps in. Good item usage just consistently throughout this game. Keeps it going for them as they're going to try to make this hold here. As PPD starting to get a little bit low, but they're just going to cut the back line, go for the CM instead. Dies almost instantly, and now it's going to be a four-on-one here as Boxy has to hold this Rax by himself. But they're just going to ignore him. He doesn't do enough damage by himself to hold this, and now Ace is going to buy back. They're going to all in for this. I imagine they just go for the throne after this Rax. Yeah, they got to go for the throne, right? There's still that tier two in the top lane. They can't get Megas out of this, and they are very slow. I think once Ace gets there, it'll speed up quite a bit. Yeah. And once Ace gets there, I, there's still such a long time for the Storm to respawn. He's got buyback in 15 seconds, though. And with Koikova's buyback here, you've got to be a little bit careful if you are NIP. Soxa, he just keeps on uh, trying to reduce the cooldown. Boxy, the Lotus Orb is going to be able to do a lot to stop this damage. 33 is actually forced to pop his BKB here as Koikova and Taiga were coming in. Boxy still being targeted. The Force Staff is going to be able to get him a little closer to that fountain. And Nip do not want to overextend themselves, especially with the Exorcism so close to being back up. But Fada himself, well, he's still got the Antis. He's still got the BKB. Alliance, they want to be able to pop that Aeon disc now so they don't have to worry about it later. Now it's going to be popped right as that. Nip, they turn around immediately with that Lotus Orb being popped. They're going to be able to get the Exorcism out. That's going to be Taiga down. Boxy is still okay, though, and he's still able to keep Nip zoned. As they are going to, they're going to hold at least the game for the time being. There are still five members of NIP around here. Is PPD going to TP back, grab the Bounty Runes, reset things a little? I think they're talking to themselves saying like, okay, let's calm down a little bit. Ace uses yeah. buyback. The game isn't 100% over yet. Let's be a little bit careful here. We got a lot of gold from that, the last big engagement. Yeah, just pace the game a little bit. There's no reason to rush things. The game is completely in your control. You have level 25 coming in for the Ursa, the uh, Assault Kuras is relatively close for 33. Games like this for me are always interesting because if you're the team that split pushes, you're always on that knife's edge. Because mm -hmm. you're always kind of, uh, you're, you kind of have to concede, like, maybe we don't have as good of a team fight. So we always have to play the split push game, go for the pickoff. You can't overrate your strength. When you go for these, like, straight up five on five engagements, thinking, like, oh, well, we've won two or three fights. Well, no, you won two or three fights because you were able to outmaneuver and outposition them. When right. you go for these all out assaults, NIP did a very good job of making these mid game adjustments where they were like, okay, how did the fight go bad? It was when we overdove, we couldn't protect Soxa in our back line, so it made it really difficult. Let's try to keep Soxa alive, keep one core on him at all times, make it so that he gets all of his spells off, his utility, and then just kite. You know, let Fada lead the charge. He's very good at using his BKB. The timing of when he uses his BKB, the cheese usage, we can play around that fact. Yeah. They showed the Bristleback bottom, then TB him onto the Shrine here. Yeah, potentially where the, the rest of the Alliance game. are smoked up right behind him. They're going to go straight for Fada, see if they can get some early damage on him. Force though. out the Aeondis, force out the BKB as best as possible. The Abyssal Blade managed to get onto making the follow-up crush as well. Force that, force that, it's not going to be enough. 90 seconds now without a Storm Fear at Alliance. Oh, I don't see how they're going to be able to do this one, especially as Koifa just get ripped apart from the exorcism. Bada, make sure to catch everyone inside of that Will-O-Wisp. All that ghost damage. <laughs> and oh, Boxy, man, he's just on the run, trying to grab the creep wave, bring it down somehow, some way, by more time for his team. He almost killed 33, That's actually. 13 but... stacks on all of them. In the end. He does fall, and he is the only one with buy, uh, with buyback here. I mean, Insania has got his ulti. I, I'm trying to see. You got that 20 armor, baby. Let's get that 20 Let's armor. Let's go. Let's get that bread. All right, they're gonna get mega creeped. Yeah. All right, Insania, just four staff yourself in. They've got a gem. This is rough. <laughs> <laughs> the situation has uh, deteriorated. Just start uh, building up those quill stacks. You know, like 30 seconds from now, we'll be able to take a fight. Slowly but surely, the Crimson Guard is doing a great job of slowing down this push, but eventually, these Raxes will fall. That's Megas. All that's left now is the Tier 4. It's 20 seconds till the Storm Spirit's back up, so plenty of time for Ninja's Pajamas to stick around, get some more damage. 
once the storm's up. Maybe they'll back away. Maybe they'll, you know, just wait for next Roshan if the win will play it super conservatively or they'll just jump in now. Go straight for Taiga. They do manage to get the four staff to get him away from the slithering crush. But Boxy with the corrosive haze and so much damage right from Ace Insania. A really great ultimate for using field, but he gets matched up by Slardar. And that damage quickly goes away. Everyone's gone. Everyone's dead. Blitz, but Storm Spirit Ooh. still alive inside of the fountain, but it just doesn't matter. Ninjas in pajamas. It was a crazy back and forth game, but they finally do manage to close out this game one. It was really well done by them. I, I thoroughly enjoyed watching this game. It was awkward at times, but you could see that both teams were trying to consistently make these adjustments. Yeah. Like, okay, this went bad. Let's do this. This was just NIP kind of persevering. The team fights, they were so good at them when they mattered. Because they weren't winning in that far more. They, I think they understood, like, okay, we just got to go for these Roshan objectives. They played those very well. The timing would go for that. And they played a decisive game. When they took that mid tower, you saw them immediately go Rosh. Take the first Aegis of the game. We need to speed up this game in our favor. They didn't over panic. I think they made the right plays. Going for the second Roshan sort of sealed up the game for them. Very well yep. done. They built up a large enough net worth. Have to say, Sox's Keeper of the Light really showing that it was probably one of the heavier nerfs in the recent B patch that came out, Keeper of the Light, just doesn't really seem to matter. That hero with farm is still able to accomplish so much as we saw from the Scythe of Ice here. Really impressive stuff from Ninja he, Pajamas. He was by far the highest priority target Yeah, on the side of uh, Alliance. Every time you saw Mickey, he just, he even used his BKB just all in, try to go for the jump. Well, this game one has been all about the adaptations inside of the game, what they, what they can do inside of this series though, We'll have to see as we go back to the panel, heading into game two. Yes, thank you very much, gents. We'll come back to Cap and Blitz, of course, for game number two, a uh, best of two or two match series, if you prefer, out there as well. That's what all the group games are. Uh, it is a victory in the end for NIP. It took a long time to break them down, didn't it, Alliance? They were very stubborn in there. Let's find out what our panel members, Purge and Fog, thought of game number one. Gents, um, uh, it was tight for a long time. It was, yep. it was back and forth, basically. Yep. Um, it it kind of looked like for a while, like uh, Alliance could have had this huge advantage if Necrophos didn't die a couple times where he kind of ran in in weird places. But in the same vein, he was also getting a lot of Reaper side kills. So it was keeping them close to net worth. And then it kind of just dragged on as the mm. uh, fight got Do you crazy. feel like NIP just played that a little bit more careful rather than KG? They were just literally being careful? Um, I, it seemed like they were more careful. It was more like Koikvo was playing not careful, I would say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He was the outlier. <laughs> Rather than say that, I, I don't necessarily want to categorize the whole team, but sure. it seemed like Quakefo was making mistakes. Yeah. But still yeah. keeping his farm up, which is okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the big thing I look and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I, I open it up and it comes up as secret because, you know, secret ace yes. and product comes up first. And it's like, oh God, wait. Uh, uh, they actually, on the side of NIP, they're, they were really good about their uh, their team fights. I felt like they were, I think only the one time in the top lane when this whole fight happened here in the replay was like the only time they actually were caught in a fight where they're like, oh God, we don't have DPO. Oh God, it's not its not like our actual time to shine. Every single time that they were taking the fights, it's like, okay, they got the willow bus up, they've got fought in a good position, and then they've got the follow-up. Mm -hmm. So was, was, it, like, was there any point in the time where you felt like Alliance, there was some windows of opportunity in this game? Windows. I mean, first 20 minutes, it was very even, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the I think the bristleback kind of thing caught off NIP a little bit with the, uh, the goo at level two. They just right. actually lost like two or three heroes over and over and over again in their laning phase. Uh, as for capitalizing, I think they actually did. I think it was they got their BKB, and I believe, I think the BKB on the Storm, and I want to say the Lotus Orb on the Bristle, and that's when they took that top fight. But I felt like it was just really hard, right? You're playing versus a team that you don't have your own great way to take Roche. You can if you have Bristle, like you have Goose stack up and everything, but you look at the comparison of NIPs, and it's like one fight, they, they'll they get Roche every time. Yeah. And they did. They got Roche, what, three times in the game, uncontested, pretty much. And then they've got this overbearing team fight on top of double lives. So Alliance doesn't have that. They don't have that overbearing team fight. You look at their draft, they actually don't have that much team fight at all. They don't have much damage either. It was yeah. another issue. I mean, the, the CM is a support and Sven is a support. Sven's not doing much damage. CM, if she gets her ulti off, is doing a lot of damage. But Slider only has to hit her three times. It doesn't matter how much armor she has. She gets stunned and then she loses her ultimate. So basically, take those two supports, throw them away. Then you got a bristle back who does mostly damage by standing with his back to you and quilling. But it's pretty straightforward for people to buy Vlad's and other armor items, so he doesn't do that much damage. It's it's basically like Storm and an Necro ulti and yeah. like Heartstop Aura. So they, yeah. they just had damage problems, kind of, mm. um, and in addition to the team fight issues. Yeah, it's like. How, how did you feel the, uh, the Storm did in this game? I know it's not a representative of exactly where he is right now, but how, how did he get on in the game? 
Um, it, it was probably hard. I mean, uh, I guess Slardar is kind of a good solution. The fact, the speed at which you can just instantly bash him is crazy, um, and it allowed Nip to just jump on him right away. It, it was that bash. It was also a bash around Ursa that Ace got. Um, they, he also had to deal with Silence. He had to deal with Will-O-Wisp. There was just a lot of problems that he had to play into, and I didn't really feel like it was a good game for us getting to see if Storm yeah, is quite. really that incredible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Blitz wasn't convinced it was the perfect Storm game, or even a good yeah. Storm game at the time, so uh, difficult to assess. Um, uh, close enough, though, that would suggest that we, we don't really know any more than we knew before the game in terms of the two teams. They're very closely matched. Yeah, they're very close. I mean, also about the hero Storm, I still don't know because he didn't lane mid. Right. I mean, I was like, oh, That's he's true. not going mid. I don't really know if this is going to change yeah. anything. So I thought he did better than I expected, I guess, in that like safe lane yeah. he ended up being in. But yeah, overall, I think Alliance, I feel like at least one type of aspect of team fight when they see this brew coddle at the first two picks, like Fada played amazing on the Death Prophet. We can already say that, 15-0-16, yeah. but PPD, on the brew, I hadn't seen him play too much, and his micro was really good inside yeah. the team fights. He was always throwing the perfect tar target up, getting the dispel off on the necrophos. So I want to see just one little element of team fight on one of these heroes. Like they didn't have for any. Alliance. Yeah, just yeah. one of them for Alliance at least. Okay, well we'll see whether that's the case after the break, uh, which is where we're heading to now. Just a very quick update from the other games. The other two matches are still going on. They're both at 1-0 right now on the stream two and stream three. Uh, just a quick look for you. Uh, Asta and Fnatic are just about eight minutes into that game. That one's already begun. Uh, the other one's just finished the draft as well. Uh, that's Chaos versus Complexity. Chaos one up in that game. Uh, if you'd like to see those games or, you know, add them to your second and your third screen each side. Uh, we're heading to a break, as I said, but when we come back, we will get into game number two here between NIP and Alliance. Well, it's quite for the double buybacks. They need to get more out of this. They're going to be able to get PPD. Yes, that's going to be one support down. Ace Cash, they came back in for the Lotus. He managed to get the Abyssal Blade back down, but it doesn't matter. Mickey still falls, and that is 100 seconds. 100 seconds where Ninja Pajamas might be able to finish off this game real nice and easy. They've lost two, though, and now it's yours uh, limping along. Boxy is still at half health, trying to kite Ace away, just keep him slowed down, but out of those grasping claws of the Ursa, will be able to get him eventually.